Texas Lutheran University. Last year we launched the Evelyn Strang Lecture in Contemporary Issues and tonight is our second time to do this and uh, you are here participating in that. I want to thank uh, the committee who helped uh, put this together. Uh, Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Debbie Cottrell is on the committee and she is here. Steve Anderson, who's in the back, uh, also helped out. And Martha Wren, who is also in the committee, and then myself, the four of us, uh, we, put, we uh, did the work to make tonight happen. And Evelyn Strang, she was a beloved professor here at TLU a native Texan and a daughter of a Fredericksburg pioneer family. Her education career spanned more than 40 years. She maintained a deep interest in this region's history, which informed her never-ending work for social justice. She was also a global traveler, a champion of environmental <coughs> preservation, and a lifelong Lutheran who strongly advocated for women to serve in church leadership roles. It is this last point in how we came to invite our speakers for this evening. I first met Bishop Reverend Sue Reiner and Reverend Judas Spent years ago, and I am honored to be able to call them friends. But I deeply admire them both as strong women and as strong leaders. One of the key reasons why they are here tonight to share with us their thoughts on adaptive leadership. Bishop Reverend Sue Reiner is originally from Canada and came into the ministry as a second career. You have a recent San Antonio Express news article at your table that gives a great overview of her accomplishments, and I encourage you to take a copy and read it to learn more. Bishop Reiner holds a degree in computer science from Duke University, which served her well in her first career in corporate leadership for a telecommunications company. However, it was when she lived in Plano and attended a small Lutheran Bible study that she began to hear God's call that led her to the ministry. In 2003, she earned a master's degree in, Divin in divinity from the Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary in South Carolina and began a path that led her into her new role as the, bishop, the new bishop of the Southwestern Texas Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, better known as the ELCA. She was one of six Lutheran women elected bishop this election year, this cycle, of which three are women of color. This is a first for the ELCA. There are 66 bishops within the ELCA, of which 16 are women. The presiding bishop that oversees all 65 synods in the United States and the Caribbean is also a woman, presiding bishop Elizabeth Eaton, the first woman, first woman to serve in that role. We mm -hmm. can say that things have certainly changed in the leadership within the ELCA. <coughs> Bishop's associate for leadership Reverend Judith Spent grew up in Arizona and California. There is also a one-page write-up Rev on Reverend Spent that also gives more details about her distinguished career. Reverend Spent earned a BA in history and her teaching credentials from San Jose State College. Life eventually took her to Puerto Rico where she completed a master's degree in divinity in 1984 and served as a pastor there for many, many years. Later in 2002, she completed a doctorate in ministry from McCormick Theological Seminary. You can see from her resume that's on your table that she served in many roles and in many amazing places such as Puerto Rico, but also the Virgin Islands, California, New Jersey, <coughs> but she did finally make her way to Texas in 2013. <laughs> her ability to fluently speak English and Spanish has propelled her through the years in evangelical and missionary <coughs> outreach that help establish many bilingual ministries in places such as the Texas Rio Grande Valley. We are blessed to have them both here tonight and to lead us in an interactive discussion on adaptive leadership. Please, will you all help me welcome our two speakers this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. <clears throat> It is our joy and privilege to be here this evening to speak at the now second annual Dr. Evelyn Strang Lecture Series. I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Strang when I first came to this area in 2012. She stopped by my office, which is right on the campus here at the Lutheran Ministry Center, and she introduced herself and wanted to welcome me to Texas. 
She then proceeded to thank me for being a woman in leadership in the church and talked about the importance of women in leadership in all facets of life. At the time, I had absolutely no idea who she was. <laughs> this tiny, feisty lady with a twinkle in her eye. I later came to appreciate the amazing leadership that she provided over the years, not only in the church, but in education, as you heard, in the community and throughout the world. She was a trailblazer in all kinds of ways, and Reverend Dr. Judith Spint and I are in the roles we are in today in Texas, in part because of her trailblazing for many, many years before. When Dr. Hoffman asked me originally to speak at this lecture series, I told her I don't do lectures. I prefer much more interactive endeavors, and so with her permission, that is what we hope this will be tonight. And because I consider leadership to be a team sport, I invited my colleague, friend, and next door neighbor, Judith, mm -hmm. to be part of this conversation. Yeah. Judith, why don't you give us a bit of background about yourself? Well, you heard several things already. Um, I'm the daughter of a pastor, felt called to ordain ministry as a very young girl. Uh, but women were not being ordained, so girls can't do that or couldn't do that. Uh, but later, it turned out that I was able to do that when I was in Puerto Rico. And all I had to do was learn a little Spanish. And I could go to seminary. So I did. Uh, while studying my MDiv, I was also learning uh, language at the same time. And so um, five and a half years later, I came out on the other end. The Puerto Rican Spanish-speaking pastor was called uh, to serve a congregation in, in the San Juan area and ordained there. So uh, happened it just happens to be that I was the first woman to serve a parish in the Lutheran Church. Um, so that was, it was pretty exciting. I was the first woman pastor I ever saw. And that was because I looked in the mirror. Um, so it, it was an opportunity to be a trailblazer, to learn how to, uh, uh, to fill up what it meant to be a woman in ministry in, in the context uh, that I lived in. Um, thinking a little bit about experiences in leadership, um, I was a teacher. I too am second career. Uh, amazingly enough, 50 years ago I entered the classroom teaching mm. eighth graders and seventh graders and ninth graders, their favorite subject, social studies. <laughs> so I, I was a teacher, and, and, uh, but it doesn't seem to, when I look back, it doesn't seem that there was any time that in some way or another I was not a leader. Um, I was a leader in youth groups, I was a leader in the synod uh, youth group, and when I was in seminary, my classmates elected me to be on the, on the uh, academic council. And so it seems to me that leadership was something that I was always involved in in some way or another. Great, thank you. A little bit about my, my background. Pastor Hoff, or sorry, Dr. Hoffman told you a little bit about that. But I spent the first 15 years of my life growing up in a very small town in Canada. And then my family moved to Miami, Florida when I was halfway through high school, which was a bit of a culture shock. Uh, and then I went to school in North Carolina and ended up uh, working for a telecommunications company for 15 years. And I, I started in development, I did field support, product management, marketing, you name it, I kind of covered the waterfront. Um, and then I felt called when I was in Plano to uproot my family and move across, back across the country to South Carolina to go to seminary. After I graduated from there, I served a congregation as, in, in Somerville, outside of Charleston, as their associate and then their senior pastor before I got a surprising call to come back here toward Texas um, to be the bishop's associate, uh, which is the role Judith has now. And, and then I was elected in May as the fifth bishop of the Southwestern Texas Synod. Katie's father was the first, grandfather, grandfather sorry, was the first bishop of the Southwestern Texas Synod and the first woman um, I discovered that south of the Mason-Dixon line um, to be elected. And so it was, it was pretty exciting. And I'd have to say my earliest memories of leadership roles that I took on were back in Brownies and Girl Guides or Girl Scouts when I ended up um, being encouraged 
to use my gifts by the other girls in the pack. And so um, it was really a time of first discovering that I had gifts for leadership. But then when I went into business, into telecommunications, I found that I was often the only woman in the room or one of the few women in the room. And so, and then when I went to church, uh, to, to lead in Change. church, um, there were a lot of women in church, but most of the leaders were men still. And so it took me a while, really many years, after serving both in business and in the church before I um, really recognized that when I see things differently than a lot of my male counterparts, that that was not actually a deficit, it could be an advantage. And so it was then that I really started to discover that I actually had leadership gifts discovered again that, that um, could be valued. So that's a little bit about me. I'm going to turn it over to Judith. Well, we're here to talk about leadership. So when you hear that word leadership, what comes to your mind? What's leadership? Some of you are even taking a class in leadership, right? <laughs> yeah. Someone who leads a group of people, like a group of followers. Somebody who leads a group of people, a group of followers. Someone who points folks in the right direction. Or mm. in the right direction. Mm. Somebody who po points folks maybe in a direction. How's that? <coughs> Would that be all right, the right direction? Other things that, that uh, yes? Someone who, an Someone who sets an mm -hmm. example. Someone who's not afraid to take charge. Yes. An innovator. An innovator. An innovator. Interesting. Interesting. All over. Yeah. Lots of things. Um, what are uh, some leaders that you admire? Can you call out names of leaders that you admire? <laughs> I'm sorry. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman. Oh. Are you getting a grade in this class? <laughs> I would agree. I would agree. So we go from, I didn't say the sublime to the ridiculous, did I? No. So Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. Hoffman, other people that you admire as leaders or that you can call out there? Pope Francis. Pope Francis? My parents. Your parents? Yeah. Obama? President, former President Obama. So, men, women, leaders that you're calling out, there may be uh, small leadership pockets or large leadership pockets on a world stage like uh, the Pope, or uh, certainly in an American political setting, um, in, a, in a home setting or, or a family setting, parents, uh, in, in your school, uh, your education setting. Uh, different leaders. What are some qualities that make them leaders? Why, why did you identify them as leaders? What caused you to say that? Um, selflessness. selflessness. They have a voice. They have a voice. Mm -hmm. Sac uh, sacrifice. Yeah. Authenticity. Authenticity. Mm -hmm. Outgoing, somebody's back here. Compassionate. Compassionate. Qualities that you see in, in yes. Trustworthy. Trustworthy. <coughs> yeah. So try to relate to their followers. Try to relate to their followers. That's kind of a relationship here going on. Yeah. Uh, Bishop, I think we can uh, move on. Play All with right. that. <laughs> so. So how many of you have heard the term adaptive leadership before? Raise your hand. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about adaptive leadership? Um, kind of listening to who you're leading and kind of adjusting yourself at, by, from what they say. Okay. All right. So that's trying to adapt to what you hear people say. All right. I want to give you uh, maybe a couple of definitions because when we talk about adaptive leadership, we're talking about leaders who are leading um, to solve particular kinds of challenges that are called adaptive challenges. And I first want to talk to you about what isn't an adaptive challenge, a technical challenge. So think about a technical challenge. There are clear goals, known methods, current knowledge. You've got what you need to be able to solve the problem. 
You kind of know what to do, or you could be trained on what to do, right? Um, predictable and manageable change, and we are already who we are or what we need to be. So what's an example of a technical challenge that you could think of that would meet some of those criteria? Hunger in Texas. Hunger in Texas. Ooh. All right. So do we know all of those? That, that could be. Um, parts of it could be. Some of it might be bigger than that, but yeah. Uh, like someone flying a plane? Uh huh. Yeah, that's right. He's got. He's been trained. He's he or she has been trained. They've got the expertise, the skills. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What else? Okay. Uh huh. Right. Mm hmm. That's right. There's a, like a discrete number of things to choose from, right? Or sometimes it seems like there's an impossible number of things to choose from, but still. <laughs> or here's another example. My, um, I woke up in the middle of the night and there was um, water rushing <laughs> out of my uh, toilet area in the, in the bathroom, right? And at first I had no idea what was going on, but I eventually got my wits about me and realized I could turn off the spigot because the thing had come loose. Um, and I knew I could call a plumber and he would fix it, right? And she knew she could call her neighbor at 1.43 in the morning <laughs> for a bucket and a mop. <laughs> that's teamwork, I'm telling you, right? So that's an example of a technical challenge. Now, contrast that, oh, and I guess going, well, I'll show you in a minute, but so the, the difference is with an adaptive challenge, you're not quite clear about the future. The road, as you can see, is not clear. The previous road had a pretty uh, winding thing, but it was going a particular direction. Resources may not have been identified. Unfamiliar roles and competencies. We don't know how to do things to solve this challenge, right? Unpredictable and uncontrollable change. And probably one of the keys is we need to become different in order to solve the challenge, okay? So if you look at the two side by side, right? Just to kind of see the differences. What do you notice? A lot of it is opposite, right? I would argue some could apply to both. Some could apply to both. That's right. So for instance, hunger in Texas, there are a lot there are probably some technical challenges that we know how to fix. But then there are some bigger adaptive challenges that we may not know how to fix, right? So as you think about the world, or our country, or this university, or your life, what are some, maybe, what's an example of a technical challenge that's facing you? School. School, all right. <laughs> yep, technical challenge, it's a lot of work. But you have professors that, it, and if you do the work and you figure it out and you get advice from your professors, you're going to get a grade that, that is likely going to pass, right? <laughs> All right, so what about some adaptive challenges that we're facing right now? Katie. The team program with the candidate for ministry. Okay, so, so Katie's getting ready to enter a process for candidacy to become a minister, ordained minister of some kind. Yeah, what else? What happens uh -huh. after college? Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. Uh -huh. right. What else? Increasing diversity on campus. Increasing uh -huh. diversity on campus. How do you do that? The ELCA has been trying to increase diversity in its. You know, we're still the whitest it's church in America. To our uh -huh. to our detriment. We've been trying that for 25 years. Yeah. Uh -huh. What else? Disaster relief. Disaster relief. Yeah. 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 What else? What other adaptive challenges might you identify? Yeah. yeah. Well, if you're a woman going to a divorce, for example, mm. the road is still a direct route. Yeah. You want to leave mother and father upset or mm -hmm. you know, maybe you don't have resources at this time. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Conflict between people in general. 
conflict between people in general. Uh huh. Yes, yeah, some of these are thorny issues, right? I mean, I think about the issues facing us politically right now, right? Um, climate change, food deserts that exist, right? Um, sustainability of small towns, small colleges, small churches, right? So lots of different things going on in the world right now. So, we have been reading a book called Canoeing in the Mountains. Um, there's what the front of it looks like. This is what mine looks like because my grandson wrote all over it. Um, <laughs> but this, this book, Canoeing in the Mountains, Christian Leadership and Uncharted Territory, uses the story of Lewis and Clark and their expedition uh, to describe some things about how it is that, uh, that adaptive leadership works and what the challenges are that we face. You may remember about Lewis, Lewis and Clark from some point when you studied history or you saw a movie or something, but maybe you didn't, maybe you don't know. Um, Lewis and Clark uh, were assigned by the U.S. government to find the passage to the Pacific across the continent. Everybody knew that all you had to do was get to the end of the Missouri River and then you could go a little ways and you'd find the river that would take you down to the Pacific. Everybody knew that <laughs> and they were uh, given that uh, assignment to do that. Uh, instead, they found themselves in the middle of the Rocky Mountains facing not only the Rocky Mountains but the Sierras as well. Mm. Uh, they got to the headwaters of the Missouri River uh, with canoes and, and using all of their orienteering and all of their skills and everything that they knew how to do. And they went over this little rise where they thought they would see the next river and it would just be a, a, an easy row down to, the, down to the Pacific. And instead they found endless, endless, endless miles of nothing but mountains. They had prepared for the journey with canoes. They had the best technology that there was. They probably had the shiniest, well, mm -hmm. they probably weren't shiny by this time, but they, had, they started out with shiny paddles. And they, had, uh, the, the, they knew how to repair canoes. They knew all the things that you needed to know about canoeing, but there were no more rivers. So they had an adaptive challenge. What were they going to do? The technology that they had at hand, the experience that they had at hand, nothing was going to take them to uh, where they needed to go. Both of these guys, both Lewis and Clark, were really good at what they did. They were military folk. They were scientific people. They had orienteering skills. And they had been selected by President Thomas Jefferson uh, to head this uh, amazing expedition uh, into the... Uh, territory to the west. Uh, but they got there at the headwaters of the Missouri River and everything was off the map. There wasn't anything there that they expected to see and they didn't know necessarily what to do next. So as you think about this country and this mm. university and your own life. We just talked about that. We did a little bit. <laughs> We did a little bit uh, technical challenges or ad adaptive challenges, which there is currently no roadmap. Um, Pastor or Bishop Sue and I have uh, some of our own examples um, of ways that we have adapted over time. I wanted to go to seminary, so all I had to do was learn Spanish. That was pretty adaptive. Um, and it was hard. <laughs> Um, and uh, I gained a lot, but I lost a lot. Uh, and on the other side, I was a different person. So there was, there was a number of, of things of, of that nature that happened. Um, we think that in the 21st century, we are probably facing more adaptive challenges now than ever before. Mm -hmm. And we find them at the micro level in our own lives. We find them in small communities. We find them at at uh, big community levels as well. And so it's important to continue to talk about this adaptive leadership stuff, to keep on opening it up and examining our experience and seeing what more we can find out. Not so that we can be masters of adaptive 
uh, leadership because then that's just another technical thing. But how, how do we live into this mm -hmm. new way of doing things? Yeah. So a couple of definitions of adaptive leadership. One comes from one of the gurus um, that did pioneering work in adaptive leadership, Ron Heifetz. And he calls adaptive leadership mobilizing people to tackle tough challenges and thrive. And then from Todd Bolsinger, who wrote the book Canoeing the Mountains, similar, energizing a community of people, right, mobilizing, energizing, toward their own transformation in order to accomplish a shared mission in the face of a changing world. So let's spend a moment unpacking those definitions. But before we do that, let me uh, just add one more piece. Um, there is a, a, a person who works mm -hmm. at the Institute for the Future, his name is Bob Johnson, and he calls this kind of challenge or this kind of work uh, VUCA, V-U-C-A, which helps us, it's a, it's a, whatever those things are where they take the front letter of everything and acronym. make an acronym, yay. Uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Let me say it again. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So in all of these things, as we are going to be uh, unpacking this, think about mm -hmm. where is the volatility? Where is the uncertainty? How, is, how complex is it? And where are the ambiguities? Okay? Excellent. So we're going to take this kind of a step at a time. And the first thing we're going to focus on is energizing a community of people. So when we were asking you about leadership, somebody back here said something about um, relationships or ability to relate. You can't be a leader without a set of people who are going to be in some kind of a relationship with you. Leaders um, can only be leaders in, in community. And so one of the, one of the uh, things that is, is important for us is that uh, leadership is only half of a relationship. There is community as well. Uh, Lewis and Clark weren't leading anything until they recruited the people that were going to go with them on their expedition. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's the, the, the issue or the importance of, of community and relationship, and we can't, uh, we just can't overemphasize uh, the importance of it. But there's some other things. Yeah. Bishop Sue? So as we talk about energizing this community of people, right, what does energizing look like? Well, as I think about it, first, uh, it's the leader who notices that there's a challenge. Right? They're the mm -hmm. ones usually that are the first to notice the challenge and to figure out, uh-oh, what am I going to do now, right? And so in order to energize the community, though, they can't keep the noticing of the challenge to themselves. They have to figure out a way to communicate what the challenge is to the community in a way that the community becomes willing and motivated to join that leader in, in tackling that tough challenge, though neither the community nor the leader know what the answer is, right? Complex, and, ambiguous, right. <laughs> ambiguous, uncertain. So, so as, a, as a bit of an example, when I first came to the Synod, I um, didn't know anything about this part of the country, and so I'm a visual person, so I... I created a set of maps because there weren't any. And they were maps of where our congregations are. So we have eight conferences, okay, and this is one of our areas. And so I created a map um, that showed me a lot of things, actually. Um, one is if you look at the, all of the red, those are small congregations that are, that are in trouble in terms of sustainability from a long-term basis, right? Um, the ones that are bold don't have a pastor currently or they don't have a called pastor, so all sorts of things. So, so when I created these maps, I began to get a sense of, uh-oh, we have a problem, Houston. <laughs> because mm -hmm. repeated all over our synod is those, are those kinds of pictures, right? 
So the thing was, though, that it wasn't until I began to share those maps with other people around the Synod that they got a sense of, holy cow, we've got a problem. And, mm -hmm. and then they were mobilized to begin to think about, uh, we might want to tackle this problem together, right? Mm -hmm. And I wish I could tell you that I, was, it was, I w brilliantly thought of that ahead of time. <laughs> But I sort of stumbled into it, right, as a way to, okay, how, what am I going to do? I'm all alone. I was feeling all alone in this. But then to be able to say, okay, if I can share just the picture, I don't have a solution. I'm just going to tell you what the problem is and get enough people motivated then to say, I think we need to tackle this problem together, right? So, and if you want to think about another um, example of that, think of the Me Too movement that really started pretty small and then started exploding on social media, right? Or Black Lives Matter, you know, it had its own hashtag and it started to be everywhere, right? And so it's not, those are movements that aren't, that aren't bringing necessarily any answers. They're not saying we know how to fix this, but they're saying other people need to know that this is a problem for us. Right? And that's how you begin to think about change. Pastor Judith. A large part of people being willing to follow or being energized to go along and get engaged in these ambiguous, uncertain, uh, volatile things is their willingness to trust their leader. Mm. Trust is not something that you can um, get at the dollar store. <laughs> or, uh, or take a class in and get an A in or anything of that nature. Trust is really something that gets developed over time as part of a relationship when leaders demonstrate their technical competence and their ability to be fundamentally the same person all the time. No matter what the circumstances, the relationships, or the challenge that they're facing, this is a trustworthy person because they're always who they say they are. It, somebody said the word authentic here mm -hmm. when we were polling you for descriptions. There's an authenticity to that person that you can trust and you, you know that they're not going to go off on you or any of the, the kinds of things that could be so mm -hmm. difficult. Um, and it takes time to build that kind of trust. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you come with some credentials that give you trust, like some of you are willing to trust us because it looks like we did a bunch of stuff in life, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of you have to trust your professors because if you don't trust them, you know, you're never going to get anywhere with that class or that grade. But the, the trust that really leads to good leadership is something that comes over time and it comes out of authenticity mm -hmm. on the part of the leader that you can pretty much be sure that they're, they're not going to go off on you and that it's going to be something is, that is um, not predictable, I don't want to say that, but you can, tr you can have confidence that they're the same person all the time. Think about some people that you know who demonstrate that kind of integrity in their relationships. You don't have to say who they are, just think about it. Think about who you know that demonstrates that kind of integrity in their relationships. Now think about some people you know who are perhaps the opposite. They mm. seem to act differently depending on the circumstances of who they're with. Which of those folks would you be more comfortable in following off into one of those foggy places? Hmm. Now, I want you to spend a moment at your tables talking about what are the qualities and behaviors of people you identify as people of integrity or trust, people that you trust. Spend a moment talking amongst yourselves. It always takes a moment. You said it always takes a moment. I don't think these are on. Yeah, they are. They're on for the. For the.
Okay, you could probably talk a lot longer about this, but just a couple of examples. What, what did you talk about as qualities that, of people that engender trust? Unwavering. Unwavering, okay. Being honest and open. Being honest and open. Even though you may not always agree with them, you know where they're coming from. Ah, yeah, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. You always know where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. What else? Being responsible, mm -hmm. showing up when they say they're going to show up, kind of basic stuff, right? Yeah, what else? Often ensure you're calm, mm. uh, mm. level head in the room. Uh huh. Know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That may so, have nothing to do with their age. That's right. So Bolsinger mm. says that before people will follow you off the map, in, or, in other words, in, before they will follow you into uncharted territory, they have to trust you on the map, right? So you've got to do things while you're still on the map with them. We were going over this with our um, deans of our conferences the other day, and one of our pastors said, oh, good, so you mean all that stuff I learned in seminary isn't a waste? <laughs> like, I actually need that too, right? I need to preach faithfully, and I need to be able to do these things, right? But it's really important um, to be able to have competence on the map before you go off the map. Judith. Adaptive challenges mean that we, as leaders, become different. It's not just that we solve the problem, but we actually become different. Uh, uh, we could call that growth. We could call it all kinds of things. And I used the example a while, a while back where um, I learned Spanish so I could go to seminary. And I came out on the other end, not only a Spanish-speaking person who could do theology, but I also became... A, a, a Puerto Rican person in the sense that I could live in that culture and I could um, speak with those people. That wasn't who I started out to be. But the, the adaptive challenge was something that made me different. Um, and so that kind of change starts with us. Um, willingness to recognize the expertise that got us where we are isn't necessarily going to get us to the next place. Mm -hmm. Uh, it won't, may not be enough to move forward. Um, there's something about courage in this. I think a couple of you, when we were mm -hmm. asking different qualities, mentioned things about courage and bravery. Uh, Brene, Dr. Brene Brown talks about the courage or the bravery to be vulnerable, to admit we don't have the answers, but we're willing to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. We're willing to wrestle with it, and we are willing to, to take on the hard questions. Uh, and then the, the other thing that I think is really interesting is the willingness to go to the edge, the willingness to go to the margins, uh, to find people to help us look at the challenges from new perspectives. Yeah. People on the margin have a much different perspective than the people who uh, are in the center. White privilege is a problem because white privilege doesn't see what's on the edge, but the edge and the margins mm -hmm. can look in and can begin to help uh, form and shape and reform or transform a culture. So people from the margins are, are uh, the ones that are going to help us find our way into these new uh, situations that are volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And we don't have the answers, but we can find allies. Yeah. And the allies are most often fought on the margins, found on the margins. Women are on the margins so many times, and people of color. So you go to the margins and begin to uh, see the challenges from a new perspective. Right. Because really, we're not talking about adaptive challenges. There's not a program to fix an adaptive challenge, right? There's not a five-year strategic plan that is going to fix a, a, an adaptive challenge. So it really is about culture. It's actually about shifting culture. Um, and, and that means that we end up becoming different. Now, when I say culture, what do you think of when I say culture? Um, what makes us who we are? What makes us who we are. Great definition. Yeah, what else? People, okay, yeah, because it, it's about people, yeah. I would say it's like the thoughts, feelings, habits, and traditions of the Native Nation. Uh huh, mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. 
Safety zone, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And much less telling like would the way people act or think that was considered the norm. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's considered the norm? Yeah. What else? Shared values or beliefs. Shared values or beliefs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Culture is like the air that we breathe. And if you're a fish, it's like swimming, the, the water that you swim in. Or I like this, um, oops, where did it go? There it is. Um, I like this thought of uh, what you see is the tree. Everything else underneath it, that's the culture stuff. So, and, and often when we're trying to address problems, we like to focus up there because it's easier, right? Oh, that's where the program sits, and that's where the technical stuff really sits. But if you really want to affect culture change, which, which talk is about transformation, this is the stuff you got to deal with, and that's thoughts, feelings, beliefs, values, often unspoken. Um, they just are what they are, right? It's the root of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> ha, ha. Yeah, I like it. I like it. <laughs> Judith. So one of, the, one of the things about this margin, going to the margins, uh, there's a great example in it in the story of uh, Lewis and Clark. They ran into a young Indian woman. Her name was Sakajawiya. She was, uh, she was a, 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 an Indian or uh, indigenous person who lived in the mountainous areas where they were coming to the end of the Missouri River, or the, not the end, the start of the Missouri River. Um, and when they didn't know what to do, when they had no technical expertise, it was this young indigenous woman on the margins mm -hmm. who began to show them some of the things that they needed to know. And so because of the young woman on the margins, they were able to uh, find food that mm -hmm. they didn't know how to find. They were able to understand something about orienting themselves not around water, but how they were going to deal with uh, the stuff that they were going to have to chop down and the stuff that they were going to have to go through and the snow that they were going to come across mm -hmm. and all of those sorts of things. Uh, Sacagawea became the, the marginalized or the margin person that helped them find their way into a uh, difficult uh, situation. They could not see or do without her. They couldn't have been successful without her. They needed what she had to share. The, th the thing that's really interesting is that Sacagawea stayed with them the whole time. She went all the way to the Pacific with them. And what does that tell you about a leader? She was committed, but she was also changed by them. Mm -hmm. The relationship that they developed made it possible for her to be another kind of a person and even to share some of the values and the goals and the desire to get all the way to the Pacific uh, that, they, that were, was part of their expedition. So the people, on the, uh, the people on the margins, the idea isn't to make white folk out of black people on the margins. The idea is that when people of color join with people who are in the center, everyone benefits because mm. culture is transformed and changed in ways that we can't even begin to imagine and incredibly enriched because of the margins. And then the people on the margins are also then able to gain technical expertise and other kinds of things from people who are, who are in the center. So the, uh, it's, it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. uh, we alluded uh, earlier to uh, the six women who were elected bishops in the most recent election cycle. That's probably the biggest assault if we could call it that, <laughs> on male privilege in the ELCA for a long time uh, because it happened all at once. Mm -hmm. There's 16 women bishops out of 66, which isn't exactly what you would call a stellar percentage. On mm. the other hand, with this kind of blow uh, towards, towards the center, uh, it's going to change what mm -hmm. uh, decision-making happens, what people think are important. It's going to change all kinds of things in the church. Um, the women who came forward in the Me Too movement and their allies began to change our culture. It's not changed yet, but we're in that volatile, uncertain, ambiguous experience 
of seeing culture change happen mm -hmm. because of leadership from people in the margins. In this case, people who were, who were um, abused and people who were uh, dreadfully uh, treated. Um, I guess I talked about uh, a little bit about being in, in another culture and maybe it was uh, it started in Puerto Rico or maybe it started somewhere else but I learned to read culture mm -hmm. and I learned to look for new situations and I looked as a, as a pastor in Puerto Rico I was able to uh, do and be things that I was not before doesn't mean I didn't leave some things behind there was loss mm -hmm. I didn't fit in real well when I um, returned to the, to the mainland. And then I went to the Virgin Islands, which is a West Indian culture. And that's even more different. And so I had to learn to, uh, uh, I learned to ha ha uh, how to live in a, in a West Indian culture as a leader. I was most of the time the only white face in my church. And so I had to be willing to learn from my folks so that they could learn from me and that I could be their mm -hmm. leader and they could, uh, they could transform me. And so, you know, it doesn't look like it, but I'm a little bit Puerto Rican and a little bit West Indian. <laughs> it's part of that adaptive challenge. And then the riches and the things that are gained from that get applied in new places mm -hmm. and help us move in amazing ways into other, off other maps and right. into newer maps. Right. <laughs> Bishop? Well, and I would say in my career as well, both in high tech as well as the church, I, I found myself often being going off the map. <laughs> I wasn't trying to go off the map, um, but I ended up moving places that were not kind of a straight up and down career path. And so I ended up doing a variety of things that I was not at all prepared for, um, which in some ways, I guess, helped me to become more open to just being vulnerable about I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to have to learn, right? Um, and so, um, and even being a, a woman in a sea of men, giving me another perspective, um, it became more and more <laughs> helpful over time. A lot of you in this room are, are students. Uh, think of the people you know who are in the margins. Perhaps it's the margins of campus life. Mm. Perhaps it's the margins in a, a place where you are in, uh, in Seguin, if you've got a side job or a hustle on the side or something like that. Who are the people that you uh, know who are on the margins? Or are you a person on the margin who is poised to begin to make a difference? Think about mm -hmm. yourself and your own leadership. Are you someone who knows people on the margins or are you somebody who is in a marginal place who is poised and ready, like Sacagawea, to make a contribution uh, to transformative change. Now, if you're not a student, you may be here because uh, you think it'd be really cool to come and hear these two people talk, or maybe you're a faculty person, or, or maybe you're, you know, your mother forced you, or some kind of thing like that. <laughs> you are here, um, in t but think of your context. Are you on the margin pushing in with new ideas and insights? Or are you in the center of the culture needing others on the margins to give you a perspective? Mm -hmm. And if so, where would you go to find those folks? Mm -hmm. Think about where, where you'd find out. You you're, want to make a comment or you want to ask a question? Or? Yeah. yeah? So, um, you talked about people on the margins mm -hmm. uh, needing to push into the central culture. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Things like That's right. Yep. Yes. Put, uh, groups of marginalized people in a position where we can't input ourselves into mm -hmm. the main culture. I mean, even some of the nomenclature that you used mm. um, is indicative of that. Where, where you come from, this uh, Sacagawea helping the Clark brothers, right? So the abuse took over help, and that's great. Mm. And it was a, a symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I, th I think that mm -hmm. we're at a point now where for the mm -hmm. past 50, 100 years in this country, um, particularly post-slavery, post-women's uh, uprising, we're in a position where the margin
marginalized don't want to push in. Mm. At least not in the general population. I know that yeah. in my, for, for my experience with the people that I know in my community, mm -hmm. they don't care. They don't want to. They've been mm. pushed out. Mm -hmm. When the inside's been pushing out so far, which then means essentially them giving up their culture. Yeah. Well, it's not giving up their culture, it's giving up their power. Mm hmm. That that's what Yeah, I mean, yeah. and yeah. that's what that what that's what makes the adaptive thing fun, <coughs> if I could use that word. I think yeah. that's what makes it fun because it isn't just going to Ikea and following the instructions. Mm. And you end up with a bookshelf. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's, that's, not, that's not how this works. It, it is full of all these dynamics. And it's full, it's, it's heavy and it's complex. And it's highly ambiguous. And it's got fear in it. It's got cultural t traditions down here that are deep and, and uh, all, all of that. That's why it's a worthy challenge. I mean, who yeah. wants to take on a challenge that doesn't have some, mm. some, something worthy to it? Yeah. Um, but yes, I think, you know, I think your, your comments are important and it's important to, because none of this is as simple as we can make it sound in 90 minutes yeah. in a couple of sound bites. Well, and, um, and, it, and it really um, says we need allies in the center that are willing to, um, to go to the margins and to um, help to bring those voices in. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Yeah. Because it's not going to make a difference. Yeah. So if there's some learned powerlessness mm -hmm. based on experience or just the apathy from the culture or not realizing what kind of difference each person can make, mm -hmm. then the leader can't really start to change the group. It's got to be yeah. that there's a, a recognition and a value yep. from both ends. And if there's not such, mm -hmm. if there's division, Yep. Yep. Yeah, and we it, it may be better to think about doing small challenges mm -hmm. before we try to fix the whole world in yep. the next 25 minutes. I mean, if you're stuck in the canoe and you're in the mountains, there's really not, you can't go, let's take a baby step. You know, well, well, you got, there you are. The baby step is there's to get that. out of the canoe. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yep. I think that as if there were, it sounds like a lot of wishful thinking, and I want to be optimistic mm -hmm. because I want to change the world and I want to change our community for the better. But it, when you look back through history, it doesn't look like something that you can do, mm -hmm. and that's that's tough mm -hmm. for me. For me, as, mm -hmm. a, as a social entrepreneur, that's tough. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's a challenge. I will say, I mean, but if you look at, for instance, LGBTQIA stuff, how far we've moved as a country in that, and how far we still have to go, right? But I never would have imagined that we'd actually have a SCOTUS decision. I mean, how many of you imagine that that would actually happen in your lifetime? Maybe in your lifetime, but I sure wasn't looking for it to happen in my lifetime after seeing all it, right? So that was huge, and that was a lot of little steps and a lot of little um, bits of courage and experiments about that. I want us to move to uh, the next part, which is in order to accomplish a shared mission. Because I think that gets to some of this as well. And how do we get people to share a mission? Judith. 
Simon Sinek, maybe you've seen his uh, YouTube video, The Golden Why, uh, emphasizes how important it is for leaders to be fundamentally clear on the purpose, fundamentally clear on the mission. Uh, mission trumps everything. It, gets, it guides the decisions that are made. It helps us make decisions between competing goods. It's not between good and bad. It's between competing goods and what it, uh, which will take us mm -hmm. in, in the direction that we want to get to. It also has to do with what behaviors are rewarded when we're paying attention to the mission. Uh, and it has to do with a, an economy of action. Um, if we're paying attention to, the mi attention to the mission, we don't waste our time out here on the side doing something that doesn't uh, further the mission. So that, that the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the shared mission, uh, a leader, wants to make sure that the whole community is sharing in that mission mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, decisions, uh, good decisions get made that can take people uh, to a place. Uh, Bishop's got a slide yeah. about uh, what are some, dif some uh, differences between mission. So when I was in South Carolina, the <coughs> hospital right around the corner from me had um, a mission that was that was plastered around their elevator and beyond. And it was this first one. We create an environment in which healing can occur. And then when I went on their website this week, they had changed it. So now they are, we are committed to the care and improvement of human life. So if you, if you think about those two different missions, right, what do you think, as they were moving from the first one to the second one, what, what kind of values or behaviors do you think they would, were going to have to reward in order to make a shift from here to here? Yeah. The actual value of the human life of actually caring for their patients instead of just getting their health better but really being mentally um, in a relationship creating a relationship with the patient. Yeah. Yeah. Stan. Technical to an adaptive, maybe, oh. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the first one seems almost passive mm. in its choice. So it's on the, it's the duty of the patient to get better. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll give yeah. you the environment, you get better. Yeah. Right. We give you a bed and it's up yeah. to you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. They are taking an active role in your health and in your state of being. Yeah. Yeah. So how we frame the mission matters a lot in terms of how we then drive behavior, right, and drive culture change. So to, to go back to Lewis and Clark, they had a mission. It was on the Pacific. There were a number of things that needed to happen between, the, uh, be between where they started out in uh, St. Louis, Missouri and the uh, mm. Pacific Ocean. They had a mission. Uh, one of the decisions that they needed to make was to remember that their mission was to get to the, to the Pacific. And when that led them to make the decision to destroy their canoes, <laughs> when it led them to make the decision to begin to to live and behave in a different way. It was because of the mission, not because they thought it would be interesting to give it a try. They did it in service of the mission. Um, what we do sometimes can cause us loss mm -hmm. as well as provide great gain. But if we do it in, the, in pursuit or in service of the mission, together in relationship, then great and amazing things can begin to happen. Uh, Bishop? So then we get to the last part, in the face of a changing world. Right? So what we talked about earlier is that the world we live in today is full of adaptive challenges, and the work of transformation is really never finished. And so it was just today, 
actually yesterday, but it was only made public today, that I saw a video that my friends in the, South, in the North Carolina Synod did. And I was so struck by it as an example of a concrete way that leaders who might feel they're powerless can begin to make change. And so I wanted us to have a look at that. And then we're going to talk about it. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hang on. It went to extend again. I know. It's going to happen again. Hmm. All right. Here we go. I've ever met. Are they all as good looking as you? Are they all as good looking as you? That must be the criteria. Are they all as good looking as you? <laughs> Come here, Pastor. I just need a little kiss for comfort. I just need a little kiss for comfort. Whoa. Good enough. I just need a little kiss for comfort. Wow. I have never met a female pastor before. What do I call you? Pastorette? What do I call you? Pastorette? These are serious? <laughs> that outfit looks really nice. We must be paying you too much. We must be paying you too much. Why would this ever come out of anyone's mouth? <laughs> You're like a little girl playing pastor up there. I've had You're that like one. A little girl playing pastor up there. Mm -hmm. I was at an all up for a bit. You don't look like a senior pastor. Mm -hmm. What's that supposed to look like? <laughs> <laughs> you are perfect for us, except for the problem that you are a woman. You are perfect for us, except for the problem that you are a woman. <laughs> I've heard that before, but the other way around, when somebody said, we're so glad that you're a man. And I said, me too, but I don't know what that means. <laughs> but I did know what I'd that really means. I really like you and think you're a great pastor, but you can't be the senior pastor because you're a female. And that's, why not? Mm. We called you because we knew we could afford you. Women pastors are cheaper. This is awkward. I, I uh, don't know what kind of reaction I need to be giving or whatever, but I, I do know, but I don't know. <gasps> Sorry. So this, this is uh, terrible. You should negotiate your salary and ask for more money. You should just be grateful you are getting a call at all as a female. You should just be grateful you're getting a call at all as a female. So when are you going to have a baby? So, when are you going to have a baby? <laughs> what are you going to do Sunday morning if your child gets sick? <laughs> what are you going to do Sunday morning if your child gets sick? I know. Take care of your kid. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's just what it is. Sorry. Take care of the child. <laughs> hey, you're looking good. Hey, you are looking. You. That is. No! <laughs> you are looking good. Yeah. Yuck. <laughs> Your belly is finally sticking out farther than your boobs do. Your belly is finally sticking out farther than your boobs do. <laughs> I heard you said you could be bishop one day. Don't you think that's going a little too far? 
Too brighter. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, guys. Like, that is what. That really sucks. That's uncomfortable. Golly. I mean, it's like I got through, what, 10? And I said, God, are we done yet? I mean, it felt like I had done 20 after 10. Each one was. We have just over 100 women on the roster. Of our 20 largest congregations, only one is led by a woman. Of the top 50 earners on the roster, six are women. Of the bottom 100 earners on the roster, 75 are women. I won't ever be able intimately to understand the uphill struggle of my sisters and colleagues in pastoral ministry. I so admire and respect their courage and faith and tenacity to keep saying yes to God's call in pastoral ministry. And so it becomes my personal conviction to do my part, to honor and support, empower, and make way for women in leadership and in pastoral ministry. Because we can't be the whole church for the sake of the gospel without the presence, the gifts, and the leadership of both men and women. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's not at all like that in Texas. <laughs> we are much more enlightened in Texas. Mm -hmm. But what did you notice about that video that we've been talking about tonight? What are some ways you could connect that with any of this? Yeah. Well, the male pastors seem to be listening to what the ladies are going through. Hmm. Yeah. So even though they were in the center, they were willing to listen to those in the margins. What else? I feel like they're not even willing to just listen. They're willing to jeopardize the power that they have mm. in order to share it with uh, people in the room. So they were willing to give up power in order to be able to, to support the women. Yeah, what else? Uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, you can say that there is so much margin and, and victory and strength from people that want to work, but you made it obvious that little by little, got to this point, now we're here to stay, right? Mm -hmm. And so there is hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It also seemed like some of the male pastors had no idea the things were being said yeah. to their coworkers. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So just highlighting, right, like the maps that I drew, right, or um, uh, Lewis and Clark bringing their whole folks up there so they could all see the mountain range, right? There's a really simple way to do that. What else? Well, and this, this is inviting every person who sees this video in, into an opportunity to participate in change. Everybody who sees this has the opportunity. You could, you know, this. You could turn it down, but you're invited. Yeah. What Which else? Is a way of creating a new kind of community. Mm -hmm. It takes something that's hidden and shameful, and so those words have power when they're spoken. Mm. Can you all hear that back here? Mm -hmm. Say it one more time. Those words are spoken as a way to try and have power over the women that are serving. And by doing this, it takes the power away from those words and gives it back to the people that are truly leaders in the community. Yeah. Um, and I think by the men saying it and reading it and like broadcasting it to all of us, it gives um, men especially who don't really the understanding of what's going on, um, the fact that it's happening to these higher up women of power, 
mm. I think they also start to realize what everyday women have mm-hmm. to go through because mm-hmm. you don't expect someone with that high power to have to go through something like that. But then you bring it down to the average woman and it's almost worse. So it's like they kind mm-hmm. of just Mm-hmm. Yeah. What else? I think um, just like listening to some of the things that were said to these female pastors um, highlights cultural viewpoints about uh, womanhood. I think, mm-hmm. you know, even sometimes they're not as sinister. I think people say them and they don't mean them to be sinister. Like right. This question of, well, if it's loud, it's Right. And that, so that person that probably said that would be probably the meaning and bias where they should. <coughs> so I think by just having men say these these statements a lot, uh-huh. you can hear the kind of ridiculousness in the question itself, right? The underlying kind of Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't believe most of these are, I mean, having experienced many of these myself, I can, I can say that the people genu- genuinely saying them aren't meaning any harm by them, but they're not thinking about it. It is part of just the culture, the air that they breathe, the water that they swim in. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <coughs> Judith? So there's this and there's the things that we've been talking about this evening. Uh, the question for you is what kind of challenges would you personally want to get involved in? to walk away from here thinking about, okay, my leadership. Mm -hmm. What's a challenge that I personally could get involved in? What's a challenge that I see? What could be a mission that I could share and get other people enthusiastic about? Um. And what's a first step I might consider taking? And who might an ally be? Hmm. So each of you, each of us, has a tremendous opportunity to lead positive change in all kinds of ways, big or small, whether you're on the margins or in the center. We need all your gifts for such a time as this. And so I invite you to go away from here thinking about that thinking about how you may be called for such a time as this to step up in leadership in some way for the good of the world. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. That's what we pastors say. (laughs) Any questions or thoughts before we adjourn? Comments? Yeah. You have to have a community that gets it. Mm -hmm. You have to have a group of people that get what you're going through. And to also be able to look for the bright spots because it's easy to focus on the really negative stuff. Yeah. It is. Mm -hmm. It absolutely is. Yep. And noticing. And it's important to, 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 you know, connect to both ways, not just we're all on the margin together, but also who are, who are those allies that we can connect with that are either on the margin or in the center? Yeah. What else? 
Most of you I thought I was called out, but oh. I, I do know. Um, it's just something for you seeing it here a bit. Um, when it comes to helping out other folks or trying to make an impact, how much thought do you put into, say, other forms of faith? Like other forms of faith. Faith? Um, are you thinking interreligious or interdenominational, or what are you thinking? Mm. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I confess that one of the things that's hard for me is for um, oppositional ones where, for instance, they don't value my leadership as a woman. So it's, it, it can be hard for me as I think about denominations that don't ordain women, for instance. Um, but I think um, things like uh, connecting with those who are Muslim or connecting with those who are Jewish or connecting with other denominations, I, th I find there to be a lot of richness um, in the conversations and learning from one another. But I do have to confess that it's hard. It's really hard for me to engage with those that, that don't even see that I have valid leadership in the church. Yeah, Susan. I have another question. Of how do women who perhaps have been ambassadors or mm. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I will say it's always exciting when I find somebody that does value leadership. I was just at the 150th anniversary of the uh, little church in Arnickeville, and I had a guy that came up to me at the end and he said, my parents grew up here, I wanted you to know I'm a Baptist pastor, and I'm thinking, I don't know how Not to take what? that, you know? Um, <laughs> And What's he goes, it's so cool that you're a bishop. Can I get a selfie with you? <laughs> <laughs> so some of it, I think, for me is to never, I shouldn't assume that just because, you know, I, we all make assumptions about how people are and what they believe. And if we don't get to know them, then we never can get past that. Yeah. Do you have anything to add on that thought, Judith? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. That's all right. Well, it was kind of going about what you were saying about um, ambassadors and such a thing. Mm. I think just it got me thinking about uh, during the 2016 election, um, it was very common for the majority of the um, reporters to refer to it as the Trump versus Hillary, mm. as opposed to using her um, surname, mm -hmm. um, despite her being a career politician. And it, it, I read, I think, like a, an essay about it, how somebody tried to defend it by saying, oh, well, there was a um, former President Clinton. Well, then you have the Bushes, the entire Bush family, you have um, <laughs> all of George yeah. W, George W, and then Jeb Bush during the 2006 election, and they were all Bush. referred to as Bush, but you then have Hillary Clinton being uh, disrespected by being addressed as her first name, and I just thought that was kind of... Right. Yeah. Well, and language both informs but it also forms us right mm -hmm. and uh, so when i was at the conference of bishops i 
last week I, where we all gather, <clears throat> I was trying to get them to change some of their language, although I do, I'm still working on it myself. This is a behavior thing. Rather than to say the women bishops, it was the, the bishops, who, some of whom happened to be women. <laughs> it's, you know, and eventually we might get to the point when, when that distinction is no longer needed, or the bishops who happen to be people of color. Uh, other, you know, but we have so few of them that now they're the people of color bishops, right? Yeah. Time for one more question or comment. You can flip it on its head and make female bishops the default for the ah. person's bishop, and then call them male bishops. Bishop. <laughs> I like it. Thank That's you a good all video. very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.